Well, good morning. Several months ago, uh, I was asked to uh, come speak up in Huntsville uh, to a large banquet uh, of, of businessmen. And they asked me to speak on uh, my new book, uh, Reflections on the Existence of God. And um, uh, as you can imagine, they, uh, they had to cancel or reschedule and so I'm going to deliver in August. But the message was all prepared and I was so energized by it and really excited about it. Uh, I thought I would share it with you uh, this morning. A number of years ago, uh, a massive 55 volume series was published called The Great Books of the Western World. And what it really was, was a series of essays uh, really discussing the important ideas that scholars and intellectuals have considered over the course of human history. And some were surprised that the longest essay in this massive work was on God. And when questioned about this, the co-editor, uh, Mortimer Adler, who was uh, a very uh, distinguished professor uh, of philosophy, and uh, he was asked about it. And at the time, he was an atheist. Uh, at the age of 82, he became a Christian. But at the time, his response, I thought, was, was pretty interesting. He said, the reason it's the longest essay, he says, because more consequences for life flow from that one issue than anything else in life. And he was talking about your view of God. Um, and what Adler was saying is that, that the greatest influence on your worldview, the way you see the world, is based on how you see God. Because your worldview really informs you about everything. It, 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 uh, uh, it, it informs you on how did we get here? Uh, why am I here? Uh, how am I supposed to live? Uh, how do you find meaning in life? And what is my ultimate destiny once this life is over? Tim Keller puts it this way. I thought this was pretty good. He said, though you may not realize it, he says, how we relate to God, either whether we believe in him or whether we don't believe in him, he says, it's the foundation of your thinking. He says, because it determines the way you view the world. He says, whether you believe God exists or not, this belief is the, found, is the foundation of in which all of your reasoning proceeds. So this clearly is a huge issue. Now, where I want to start and where I want to kind of lay the groundwork, it's really one of the reasons, well, I wrote the book for many reasons, but uh, I want to lay the groundwork for today's message by sharing with you the spiritual journey of Dr. Francis Collins. I think most people will admit Collins is probably uh, one of the most well-known, celebrated scientists of our time. Um, he graduated with a degree in chemistry from the University of Virginia, went on and got his PhD at Yale. Um, and then I guess he just loved getting educated because he, he decided to get his MD, his medical degree, um, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. From there, he went back and taught chemistry at Yale. And then he took on probably the most significant thing of his life when he chaired the Human Genome Project, where he led an international collaboration of 2,000 scientists in sequencing the human genome. And then after that, uh, President Obama appointed him director of the National Institute of Health. So this guy, he's a big deal. And in his year, in the years that he was in college and graduate school and then in medical school, uh, he described himself as an atheist. And this is really a, a really cool story. He tells in his, in his uh, residency uh, at Chapel Hill, he had a patient. It was a, a really sweet little old lady. Um, and as he put it, she'd really run out of options. So she was, she was dying. Uh, and yet she had this strong faith and she would talk to him and was very calm and tranquil. And he said, one day she asked me out of the blue, she said, Dr. Collins, you've been so kind to listen to me, uh, particularly talk about my faith. She said, you've never told me about your faith. What do you believe? And Colin said, 
I was just floored by the question. Nobody ever asked me that question. He said, particularly in such a sincere way. And he said, I, did, I, I, was, I didn't know how to answer her. He said, but it caused me to begin to think and wonder, am I an atheist because I've looked at the evidence and come to the, that conclusion? Or am I an atheist because that's really just the way I want life to be and that's the way so many of my colleagues believe? And then he said, you know, I realized that when it comes to, as a scientist, I always insisted on collecting data and evidence and then coming to conclusions. He said, but when it came to the issue of faith, he said, I'd never looked at any evidence. And so he began kind of a search and he began to read books. Uh, he read C.S. Lewis, he even began to read the Bible. And as you probably can guess, he, uh, he eventually completely changed his mind and became a very devoted Christian, which he still is to this day. But this is why I share this story, and this is why I think it's so important. Collins today believes that most of the skeptics that he meets today are just like he was. That is to say, they claim to be atheists, but they've never looked at any evidence that's available. Dallas Willard completely agrees with him. Now, Willard died a couple of years ago, but he was a philosopher. He taught philosophy at USC. In fact, he was head of the philosophy department at USC for several years. And he came up with a term that I think is interesting. He says, so many of the people that he encounters that claim uh, to not believe in God, he says they are guilty of what he calls irresponsible disbelief. In other words, they all took their positions to disbelieve without a commitment to examine the evidence. And so I wonder how many people are guilty today of irresponsible disbelief. <clears throat> Probably six months ago, I read an interesting, I think it was a blog uh, that was written um, about a, a, an essay that had been discovered about examining evidence. And, um, you know, if you think about it, um, when it comes to truth, you can't invent truth. You can only discover it. And you discover it by examining the available evidence. And in this essay, which was called Ethics of Belief, it was written by a young philosopher by, name of, by the name of William Clifford. It was written 150 years ago, and somebody just discovered it, and it's kind of made the rounds now. And Clifford believed we have to, we, this is what he said, we have a moral obligation to believe responsibly. And the reason he says is because your beliefs influence your actions. They're, they're the foundation of your life, what you believe. And reading the guy that, that, that uh, wrote the blog, as he commented on this essay, he said, quote, every single belief has the capacity to be truly consequential particularly if the belief is in error and involves the most significant issues of life. And so what, what is the evidence? What is the evidence for the existence of God? Well, that's what the, this book that I wrote is about. And I must say, say that I contend the evidence for God is quite compelling. And what you're going to see this morning is how atheism is a massive contradiction. In fact, that's what troubled C.S. Lewis so much as an atheist before he became a Christian. He said, my life was one massive contradiction. And as we get through this, you'll see what he meant by that. Now, the book is divided into 10 sections. There's five or six essays in each section, a total of 57 essays. And this morning, I'm just going to cover material from really about four or five of those essays. So you see, you're going to see there's a lot of evidence that's out there. Um, so as, as I go through this, I'm going to contrast, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some issues, and I'm going to contrast the Christian view with the atheist view. And 
what we need to ask ourselves, and I would ask you to ask yourself this morning, is which view truly fits the actual world that we live in? Or as Tim Keller asked, which account, Christianity or atheism, has the most explanatory power to make sense of what we see in the world and what we experience in life? And I, th I really believe that you're going to find this very interesting, but also very revealing. Now, let's take something in your everyday life that we all experience. And where I want to start is with the issue of love. What is love? Where did love come from? The problem is, if you're an atheist, and you're an honest atheist with integrity, you don't believe it exists. As the famous psychologist, B.F. Skinner, he, he taught at Harvard, the father of behaviorism. I, I studied him in college in psychology classes. He said this, he says, you need to understand that love is an illusion. One of his later colleagues at Harvard, Daniel we uh, Wegner said, and he agreed, he says, love is an illusion because all of our feelings, including love, he says, are the effects of unconscious physical causes. And then one of the, 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 the great scientists in our world, Dr. Francis Crick, uh, who discovered DNA, um, also an atheist, he believed that all the joys in life are no more than, quote, the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. He said, therefore, you are nothing more than a molecule machine. And the love that you think you're experiencing is only a biological reaction. I bet you didn't know that. You know, what these guys are saying is that we are nothing but a mass of chemicals. And chemicals can't love. And that's true. Chemicals can't love. Skinner describes us as a machine that responds mechanically to stimuli. But you have to ask yourself, are we really machines? Is it that simple? I'm reminded of a, a significant chess match several years ago. I'm not really that much into chess, but I don't, you may remember it. When the computer Deep Blue, which I think was an IBM uh, computer, um, was in a chess match and beat the world champion, Gary Kasparov. And this, of course, caused a number of people uh, to start comparing machines with humans and, 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 and concluding we're nothing but sophisticated machines. But I love what Yale professor of computer science, David Gertner, uh, said about this. This was in Time Magazine. He said, the idea that Deep Blue has a mind is absolutely absurd. How can an object that wants nothing, fears nothing, enjoys nothing, needs nothing, and cares about nothing have a mind? It can win at chess, but not because it wants to. It isn't happy when it wins or sad when it loses. I mean, what are its plans if it beats Kasparov? Is it hoping to take Deep Pink out for a night on the town? He continues and says, the gap between human and machine is permanent and always will be. Machines will continue to make life easier, healthier, richer, and more puzzling, and humans will continue to care and love, ultimately about the same things they always have, about themselves, about one another, and for many of them, God. And so I ask you to think this morning, is love a reality in your life? Do you really love your wife? Do you truly love your kids? You see, Christianity supports the highest aspirations of love. It recognizes love to be real because the God of the Bible is the source of that love, and we are made in his image. Now, I got a great story I'm going to tell you about this that really kind of reveals uh, the, the truth of what... Uh, I'm talking about. And it's about a man. He was a journalist and an author. I don't, he may still be alive. And his, his name was A.N. Wilson, capital A, capital N, Wilson. And many thought Wilson was going to become the next C.S. Lewis. 
he was brilliant, he was uh, articulate, and he was a great writer, and he was a committed Christian. And then something, uh, something happened. He recanted his faith. He claimed to be an atheist. And two men that he knew pretty well there at Oxford, um, I don't know if Hitchens was there, but he was good friends with Christopher Hitchens who died recently, or maybe a couple of years ago, and um, Richard Dawkins. And they were thrilled. They all kind of, uh, were th kind of came together and were thrilled at his newfound faith in atheism. And he, uh, he mocked uh, Christianity for many years. But then something very strange happened to Wilson. He stunned all of his followers, all of his new followers. He returned to the Christian faith. But the reason that he returned is so interesting, is very pertinent to what I'm talking about this morning. He gave an interview with a publication called The New Statesman. And he explained his reasons for coming back to Christianity. And he said, what I realize, he said that atheists are missing out, these are his words, are missing out on some very basic experiences of life. He recognized that the Christian perception of life was so much deeper, wiser, and more rounded than the faith that he had in atheism. And he concluded that, th that those people insist that we are simply anthropoid apes cannot account for the basic experiences of life. He says, particularly love. He also observed how the Christian faith transformed people's individual lives and it convinced Wilson that the Christian faith is simply true. So he, refer he returned to faith in Christ. Now, I'll look at a second life experience or human experience that we can all relate to. Several years ago, and I was trying to remember where I was going, I, I think my family was down at the beach. I mean, this is like 15 years ago, but I can remember this so vividly. And I'm driving down there to meet them. And it was late in the afternoon and the sun was setting. And it was one of those sunsets that you probably you know, that you rarely see that's just so magnificent. And I'm driving down, I think I was on a back road. I think I'd gotten off the interstate and it was just so beautiful and so moving. And I was listening to the radio and right at that time, one of my favorite songs in college came on the radio, Stairway to Heaven. You may, some of you older guys may remember this by Led Zeppelin. And for about five minutes while the song was playing and I'm watching the sunset, I had this euphoric um, feeling. I mean, I was moved in a very powerful way. And as I look back, it was because of the beauty, the visual beauty of the sunset and the audio beauty from the song. But just like love, you got to ask the question, what is beauty? What is real beauty? And why are we so moved by it? C.S. Lewis said, it's the clue to the meaning of the universe. He says, it's a sign that points you to something very significant. Because we were made to love and we were made to appreciate beauty. But the question is, what are we, make, what are we to make of beauty if there is no God? What do we make of beauty if we are nothing but chemical, chemicals and molecules? Probably the most well-known, outspoken atheist in our world today is Richard Dawkins. Uh, he wrote a best-selling book called The God Delusion. And in the book, he's very blunt about it. He says this, beauty is just a chemical reaction in the brain. It does not truly exist. It's not real. Now, what do you say to that? Particularly when you think about all that we experience in this life. You see, atheists believe that life is nothing more than living in a one-dimensional world, a sheer biological existence. 
And guys, if you reduce the world to nothing but chemicals and matter, I truly believe you risk, you take the risk of losing your sense of wonder and the appreciation of beauty. And you drain all the joy out of life. And I have a great example of this. It's in the book. It's in the life of Charles Darwin. You all know Char Charles Darwin or familiar with him. Uh, what a lot of people know, he grew up in the church and really had somewhat of a theistic worldview uh, the first, say, 30 years of his life. But then as he got enmeshed in science and his research and work, he rejected God and became an atheist. And in his biography, his autobiography, listen to what he says as it relates to beauty and the loss of it. He says, up to the age of 30 or beyond, poetry of many kinds gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare. He said, Former, formerly, artwork gave me considerable joy and music very great delight. But now for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I've tried to read Shakespeare and found it intolerably dull. In fact, it nauseated me. He says, I've almost lost any taste for artwork or music. He said, I, I retain some taste for fine scenery, but it doesn't cause me the great exquisite delight that it once did. He says, my mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of a large collection of facts. He says, the loss of these tastes has been a loss of happiness for me. And it may possibly be injurious to the, to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. So this is, a, this is the question all atheists need to ask. How do we account for all the joy and the beauty that we experience in life? How do we account for being moved by the beauty of a sunset or a starlit night? You see, the argument for beauty works like the argument for human love, if you think about it. You see, atheism doesn't appear to have a plausible explanation for the human appreciation for beauty, and therefore just has to conclude it's an illusion. However, it's, I, I'm convinced it's very difficult, I don't care what you believe, to accept this conclusion when we continually encounter beauty that moves us in such a powerful way. And so if you really think about it, it's easy to claim to be an atheist, but it's truly hard to live as if it were true. Now this third life experience is kind of mind boggling. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna, uh, well, let me just, I'll just dive into it. Uh, imagine, uh, since now we've kind of opened up uh, and can get out and, but imagine you're walking through a park and you'll notice a lot of things, rocks and dirt and grass and trees and plants, and maybe there'll be a pond with water. There'll be a lot of physical matter out there. And I, I would encourage you to ask yourself this question, how did this type of matter gradually over time evolve into beings that are conscious they can think and reason and are aware of themselves. I mean, seriously, could dirt and rocks and water produce beings that can think and reason? Please hear this. The issue of human consciousness is a real problem of the atheistic worldview. I go back to Richard Dawkins. That I just met, who I just mentioned, he says, I can't explain human consciousness. I can't explain it. And one of his good friends, Steven Pinker, who teaches psychology at Harvard and wrote a book titled How the Mind Works, Pinker, when asked to explain how human consciousness came about in a godless universe, you know what he said? Beats the heck out of me. I have no idea. Now, th this is kind of almost getting to the point of being absurd, but this has caused a number of scientists 
who embraced the atheistic worldview, as they look reality in the eye, they have to admit the obvious. For instance, Cambridge psychologist Nicholas Humphrey says this. This is, this is hard to believe. He says, our starting assumption as scientists ought to be that on some level, consciousness has to be an illusion. An illusion. He says, the reason is obvious. If nothing in the physical world can have the features that consciousness seems to have, then consciousness cannot exist as a thing in the physical world. I got to read that again. Consciousness cannot exist as a thing in the physical world. Do you hear what he's saying? Since there is no God, all of life is physical and material. Your thinking, therefore, is a chemical reaction in your brain. And consciousness is, therefore, <clears throat> an illusion in your life. Francis Crick, who, have already, who I've already quoted, very brilliant scientist, this, he, he tries to explain it this way. He says, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. He concludes by saying, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. Did you know that? You are nothing but a pack of neurons. I mean, you gotta admit, these are extreme beliefs. But you know, they're consistent with the atheistic worldview. Nancy Piercy, who was a great Christian scholar and thinker, <laughs> therefore asked this very logical question. Why would anyone come up with a theory that is so contrary to your normal everyday life experience? And then she said somewhat humorously, and why should we trust the thinking of scientists who tell us there's no such thing as thinking? Do you see the irrationality of this? But that's the natural consequence of the atheistic worldview. Listen to this man who sees the problem of all this. This guy, is a, he's an atheist and rejecting the reality of human consciousness he talks about, and he kind of really looks reality in the eye. His name is Colin McGinn. He's a British philosopher. He's taught at Oxford and many other prestigious universities. He's written over 20 books. His specialty is the philosophy of the mind. <clears throat> and he claims to be a religious skeptic, but then he says this. This is one of the most reasonable things I've seen uh, in this. He says, we do not know how consciousness might have arisen by material process from antecedently existing material things. And then listen to this, this is significant. He says, one is tempted, however, reluctantly to turn to divine assistance. This is an atheist. We must reluctantly turn to divine assistance because he says, it would take a supernatural mag magician to extract consciousness from matter. Now there's intellectual integrity. And of course, how does the Christian worldview account for human consciousness? Well, it's pretty simple. We're the only creatures on earth designed in the image of God. We're endowed with so many of his characteristics, including being conscious with the ability to think and reason. Now, I have worked on this book on and off for 25 years or so. And I always seem to come across or come away with a frequent observation. And that is, and this is what C.S. Lewis experienced, the contradictory nature of atheism. Please hear this, and I said this earlier. It's easy to claim to be an atheist, but it's hard to live as if it were true. And the contradiction is generally a tension between logic and how life works. And so many atheists like A. N. Wilson recognize the contradictory nature of their atheistic worldview and being honest people conclude 
that it's just not livable. And even Richard Dawkins, this is amazing, even Richard Dawkins has acknowledged the inconsistency in his atheistic worldview and how he lives. He says, I can't really live out this godless worldview. He says, quote, otherwise life would be intolerable. But I might add that it only seems logical that if your worldview does not work out in the real world, there must be something wrong with it. Particularly if it can't explain everyday life. And Nancy Pierce, says, a good way to evaluate a worldview is to submit it to a very practical test. Does it fit what we experience in life? You see, Christianity and the Christian worldview clearly makes sense out of what we see and experience. It clearly has the most explanatory power to make sense of what we see out in the world. Where atheism presents a view of life that is not in harmony with reality. And hopefully you see how Christianity it is logical, it is non-contradictory, and it is more fully true to the facts of human existence. And the reason for this is quite simply this. It's true. It is the truth of life. Now, I've got about 10 more minutes, 10 or 12 more minutes, because I don't want to keep you too long. I get real excited about this, and I get real fired up about it, as you can tell. Um, but I want to close with what I call um, theism's two strongest arguments. And the first one is a, a, an essay from the book. And um, both Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins both agree um, that, uh, that the fine tuning of the universe, which I'm going to talk about, is theism's strongest argument. It poses the greatest threat to atheism. And a guy named Paul Davies, and just, just hang in with me, I'm going to explain all the fine tuning uh, in just a second, but Paul Davies is a very highly regarded English physicist, and he's a skeptic. He wrote a, a, a popular book titled The Cosmic Blueprint. And in it, Davy says, he makes some incredible statements about how the universe is exquisitely fine-tuned and it must be for any conceivable life form, life form to exist. But listen, he concludes the book by confessing that the evidence is so overwhelming that there must be someone behind it all to be able to explain the fine-tuning universe we live in. I'm going to give you a quick definition of fine tuning and then I'm going to take a minute just to maybe explain a, a few th thoughts on it. Uh, fine tuning is the condition that allows life to exist in the universe and it can, can occur only when certain universal constants lie within a very narrow range of values. If any of several constants were only slightly different, the universe would not, would, the universe would be unlikely to be conducive to the establishment of life. Now this is what this is fascinating. <clears throat> Today's astrophysics seem to agree that there are there are close to 122 variables that would need to be lined up with perfect precision in order for our universe to exist, in order for our world to exist, in order for us to be here. Now, one example that you're probably familiar with is the sun. I was just reading about this yesterday. It's called the, 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 the earth is in what it's called a Goldilocks zone as we revolve around the sun. We're not too close where we burn up. We're not too far away. We're just the right place. But any real shift would have major consequences to our, but for thousands of years, our, our world has been in this Goldilocks zone. And that's just one of the variables. There's 122 of them. And that's why so many people are staggered by this. In fact, a guy that I've, I've, I've been familiar with uh, for a number of years, a guy by the name of Fred Hoyle, um, he's a highly regarded physicist and he's an atheist. But as you can imagine, he was quite shaken up when he first was kind of presented with and read about the evidence of this very delicately fine-tuned universe. And you know what he concluded? He said, there has to be some kind of intelligence behind this. And then he uttered these words that if these, these have become famous. And he says this, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that some super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry and biology. 
and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Which leads to a really, I think, important question. How do atheist scientists deal with this very thorny issue, this delicately fine-tuned universe? And this is amazing. This is amazing how they deal with it. I'm going to share from three different scientists. What is, how does Richard Dawkins account for it? I'm, these are his words. He says, well, it could come about in the following way. It could be that if some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they came here and seeded into our world, perhaps this planet. Now, that's a possibility and an intriguing possibility. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence that if you look at the details of biochemistry and molecular, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. You hear that? There's a designer out there. And he's some super intellect alien in some far off place. Astrophysicist John Gribben says, serious consideration should be given to the hypothesis that our universe is an artificial construct manufactured deliberately by intelligent beings in another universe. And then many of you will remember Carl Sagan, yeah, that famous TV series, Cosmos. Uh, he was a renowned astronomer in cosmology. He believes that one day, of course, he's deceased now, but he believed truly with all of her that one day these extraterrestrials are going to come to our planet and explain to us how life worked how we got here, and how the universe is so finely tuned. But what I find interesting is that these scientists don't seem to have a problem believing in some form of intelligent design and designer. They just refuse to believe in God as the divine intelligent designer. And I sometimes wonder if the problem of modern skeptics is that at their heart of hearts, they really don't want there to be a God regardless of the evidence. There's a very famous quote from a, uh, a philosophy professor at NYU. His name is Thomas Nagel, and I've read this in many different books because it's an incredible admission about his views. And this is a very well thought of professor. And this is what he says about his atheistic belief. He said, bottom line, I want atheism to be true. And I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be that way. I mean, think about what he said. I want atheism to be true. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be that way. So that's what I'm going to believe. Now, I first read seriously about the fine-tuning of the universe in a book by Dr. Vince Vitale, who co-authored it with uh, Robbie Zacharias. And he says, when it comes to the fine-tuning of the universe, he said, we're seeing more and more scientists attribute it to some type of alien culture, because that's all they can come up with. He says, these type of explanations are cropping up in scholarly literature as an effort to avoid having to admit the existence of God. He says, it is a testimony to the strength of the fine tuning argument. Now, as I wrap this up, I really believe that the most powerful argument for the existence of God, in, the, in my opinion, because I've spent so many years studying it. And I remember my son asked me years ago, dad, why do we believe in God? And I said, well, there are a lot of reasons, son, but the, the main reason is because of Jesus. You know, it's great if you think about it to have all this evidence that there's some God exists out there, but how, how much value is it if we don't know who he is? You see, that's, the, that's what Christianity is all about. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a faith that's based on revelation that God comes into the world and reveals himself to us, as it says in the book of John, that he became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory.
So the big question is, is Jesus God? I have a whole section on this in the book and I don't have much time. So let me just say this, I'll be very brief. I lay out four vital points to make the argument that Jesus is the son of God. The first is his incredible impact on human history. One of the most celebrated historians of all time, H.G. Wells, says that Jesus has had the big, and he doesn't believe in him. He doesn't believe in, he doesn't believe in God. But Wells says he's had the greatest impact on human history. In fact, he puts it this way. He is the most dominant figure in all of human history. I mean, just think about it in these terms. <clears throat> the time in our world revolves around his birth, B.C. and A.D., The second evidence, of course, is the resurrection. And I'm telling you, the to, to try to um, debunk the resurrection is incredibly difficult because so many people have tried it. I remember giving a, a talk titled Jesus, Divine or Mythical, or Mythological, excuse me. And as I was doing the research, I really began to notice how many men recognize that Christianity will rise and fall on the resurrection and they believe if I can if I can debunk it, if I can prove that it's not true, then I basically <clears throat> can, I guess you could, you, that would lead to the demise of Christianity. I think they arrogantly thought they could do it. And as I was doing my research, I realized how many men had done this, attempted to overturn the belief in the resurrection. And yet what I found, how many changed their mind once they looked at the evidence. And the list has grown. J.D. Anderson, Gilbert West, Lee Strobel, William Ramsey, Josh McDowell, Frank Morrison. And Dallas Willard makes an interesting point. He says, you know why they changed their minds in their quest to debunk Jesus and his claims of resurrection? He says, because for the first time, they were forced to examine the evidence and think carefully about it. And though we don't have time, it's in the book. The evidence for the resurrection is hard to dispute. Third, how Jesus fulfills the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Do you know that in the Old Testament, there are 44 very clear Messianic prophecies. In other words, these are prophecies about the Jewish Messiah that is to come. And Jesus fulfills all 44 of them. Blaise Pascal says this was the major reason he became a Christian. Pascal was a mathematician. He says the, the, the mathematical possibility for that happen is almost, it's just impossible. And yet Jesus fulfilled all 44 of them. And finally, and this is kind of where I'm gonna leave this, I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes on this and we'll be done. Jesus, finally, I, this, this, is, this is number four. Jesus had such an incredible impact on history, but he did it not by earthly power, but through a simple, modest, humble, and short life. Think about that. I want to leave you with this powerful story and then a quote, and we'll be done. But as we think about the humility of Christ and how he never, he never traveled far from his home in the most desolate part of the Roman Empire, I want to share with you this story of the French philosopher and anthropologist René Girard, who was a very accomplished man. Uh, he ended his career as a distinguished professor at Stanford. Uh, at a certain point in his studies and research, Girard began to notice that a cavalcade of liberation movements, uh, the ab abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, women's rights, minority rights, human rights, they all had gathered speed in the 19th and 20th centuries. He says the trend mystified Gerard because he found nothing comparable in all his readings in ancient literature. And through his further research, he traced this phenomenon back to the historical figure of Jesus. He said it struck Gerard that Jesus's story cuts against the grain of every heroic story from its time. Indeed, Jesus chose poverty and disgrace. He spent his infancy as a refugee. He lived in a minority race under a harsh regime. He died as a prisoner. From the very beginning, Jesus took the side of the underdog, the poor, 
the oppressed, the sick, the marginalized. His crucifixion, Gerard concluded, introduced a new plot to history. The victim becomes a hero by being a victim. Gerard recognized that 2,000 years later, the, ver the reverberations from Christ's life had not stopped. And yet, ironically, at the center of the Christian faith hangs a suffering Christ on the cross, dying in shame for all the world to see. And to the shock and consternation of all of his friends and secular colleagues, Gerard announced that he had become a Christian because of the unexplainable, humble life of Jesus. I leave you with this quote. This, <clears throat> this comes from Napoleon uh, just before he died. And he was reflecting on this great desire that he had to rule the world. That was his goal. That was his desire. These are his words. I died before my time. And my body shall be given back to the earth and devoured by worms. What an abysmal gulf between my deep miseries and the eternal kingdom of Christ. I marvel that whereas the ambitions, the ambitious dreams of myself and of Alexander the Great and of Caesar should have vanished into thin air, and yet a Judean peasant, Jesus, should be able to stretch his hands across the centuries and control the destiny of men and nations. How do you explain that? Well, simply because he was the son of God. Now, hopefully, this message this morning has benefited you. Um, if you found it interesting, uh, you may want to get a copy of, uh, of this newest book that I've written, Reflections on the Existence of God, because I really, if you find this interesting, I barely really touch the surface, scratch the surface on all the evidence that's there. Uh, there's so much more. And um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you wanna know where to get a copy, obviously you can buy it on Amazon. You know, it's uh, in the times we're in, it's, taking, uh, it's difficult to get it to you on a timely basis. Um, you can go to, uh, we've got several websites. We've got Center's website, you can buy it there, uh, the centerbham.org. Um, you can go to my website, which is Richard E. Simmons 3, all lowercase, Richard E. Simmons 3.com. And then we have a landing page, uh, and it, you can go to it. It's the existence of God book.com. So there are all kinds of ways you can get it. So if you're interested in that, uh, uh, we'd love to have you read it. Um, thank you for being with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to close with a simple prayer, and we'll be done. Uh, Father, we are truly thankful that uh, not only you exist, but that you have revealed yourself in such a clear way uh, as we seek to think logically about this issue. But most significantly, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in the person of Christ. Uh, we thank you for him, his life, and just the difference he makes in a person's life. And we pray all of that in his name. Amen. Thank you very much.